It had been three days since I had eaten. I was just... I know the tales of the house. The kitchen was bare, and I saw a door leading down. I... I just wanted to wet my lips, you know? But that thing, that abhorrent thing... It's Hoodie Kobold, and welcome back to part four of our GM's Guide to the Ghost of Saltmarsh Adventure. In our previous ones, we focused on the town of Saltmarsh and all the buildings inside of it and all the different things you can do and the region around it. Links to those videos will be in the description down below. In this part, we're going to focus on the first adventure, the Sinister Secret of Saltmarsh. So before we go any further, though, I do want to give a spoiler warning. I haven't really said that explicitly before because I didn't think it was too necessary, but now we're actually diving into an adventure, and uh, if you go any further, you're gonna ruin the adventure for you, so uh, so stop now. And if you're a player, send this to your GM and maybe they'll use it. So the first thing we really need to think about is why are we here? Like, why are the players here? The book does provide a couple different reasons of, you know, hooking your players to get them to the table, and the first one is the Hidden Horde. This is where this is a fabled house, a fabled haunted house, and it must hold treasures. So the players decide they need to go inside to hunt down those treasures. The second one is Knowledge Unlimited. Because there was an alchemist who used to do all these different unholy experiments, he must have different secrets or treasures in there, and uh, the players want to go in there to take that. Our last hook is It Must Be Cleansed. And this is the one I recommend taking. The reason here is that it's going to introduce the council members early, or at least Anders Solmore early. What I'd recommend doing is have him invite the characters, either through an envoy or through a letter, depending on where they exactly start, and have them come to his house. So he brings them, invites them into his house for a banquet where he makes his offering for uh, the adventure. And also, I really recommend bringing in the poacher early. So the person that's going to tell this this horror story, this ghost story. Bring him in early so that the characters, you don't have to worry about the characters deciding, oh, I'm, let's not ask the town, let's just go up to the house now. So it kind of, they can subvert that possibility of really selling the horror. So if you, you bring them in, you have them tell it right then. So after he tells the horror story, that's when the characters now kind of know the story, they can ask some questions, and um, if you can, I'd recommend even trying to get the poacher to go with them. And with that, you have a party that is now going to head to the haunted house. The house was built a long time ago. Um, it doesn't really describe who built the house, but it just said that it has an alchemist who was very um, hermit-like and kept to themselves way up on the hill. So it definitely has that like old man hermit vibe where he just kind of lives on the outskirts of town and no one really bothers with him and he kind of leaves everyone else alone as well. So the big thing about the haunted house is this is a chance that you can give horror. You can really delve into it. Uh, most of the time in d and I find that the adventurers want to kind of be these kind of kick in the door characters where they're just, you know, kicking in the doors and taking names and they don't really have that that fear. But since this is a first level adventure, this is a good chance, a good opportunity to really sell the horror scenario. So here's where we're gonna bring in all those horror aspects. So you really wanna make sure you set um, lighting if possible, um, if you are able to play uh, locally with each other, and definitely use music. Music is a good way to bring those creepy horror vibes into the situation. Just make sure that you control the volume. That's one of the things that I've heard a lot where people want to bring in music, but it's too loud and now people can't hear each other talk. You just want to be able to make sure that your speaking volumes are still good, but those subtle noises and ambiance can still be heard. There's a plethora of horror music that you can play, and I recommend just making sure that you find the right ones that are going to fit this need for, you know, when they're 
creeping up to the house, they're exploring the house, etc. So just think of different tones that you may want to bring. So after the trek up the hill, your players have finally made it to the haunted house. So instead of going over each of the different locations, I think it'd be best just to kind of talk about the ones that really need to be hammered down. So the first one that actually happens is right outside. There's a garden, uh, a rose bush that's kind of overgrown. And what I recommend doing here is hopefully you brought the poacher, get him to get a little bit away from the party and then have the giant weasels kind of run out, snatch him and yank him back into the bush. Allow your players to make rolls to see if they saw anything. Then mysteriously, that poacher is now not here. Or even better, if someone saw it, but they didn't quite see what it was. So they just know something came and snatched him. The next one is room four. It's one of the living areas. So in this area, there's a trap door that leads down into the cellar. But there's actually been a spell, magic mouth, put on it that reads, Welcome, fools. Welcome to your deaths. Ha 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 ha. So make sure you really play it up. Get that one kind of going. If you can, once your players enter the room, just stay right away. Just snap it off and hopefully add a little fear to them. Now, if this magic mouth does pop off, it will let some people know down below that there are people above. So this will uh, matter a little bit more later. So they're going to start preparing. The next room is the scullery. Uh, that's room 10. So this is also a similar situation where there's the, uh, a spell of magic mouth that's been cast on the stairs leading down into the cellar. Now these ones are just random screams of horror. So they could sound like ghosts or some specters, something like that. Again, just to really add fear to the players. The next one that really does need to be talked about is the crumbling bedroom, room 14. This is the room that contains clues on the windows that seem like they're scuff marks. Now, this is caused by a lantern that gets placed here every so often, and this lantern is making scuff marks here. Another very important room upstairs is room 15, Ned's bedroom. Now, this one is definitely a strange one, and it has a couple clues that are meant to be red herrings. So the first one is that the door's locked, but the keys are right outside. So it's meant to sell to the players that there's no way Ned did this even though Ned did. So when they do get into the room, they'll find Ned, who's been bound and gagged. And then once freed, this is when he kind of starts his master plan. So Ned is a spy from the Scarlet Brotherhood, who was sent here to kind of throw the players off the trail. So he's meant to frame the smugglers that are actually using this house as slavers and try to pin the whole thing on Gellin Primewater. To make sure that the players go upstairs, one thing you can do is just have Ned rock back and forth on his chair. So there's constant noises upstairs. This will hopefully guide your players to go upstairs and check out all the rooms up there before they go downstairs into the cellar. The most likely way that they're gonna go downstairs is through room 20, the wine cellar. Here they're gonna find some corpse of an adventurer maybe long ago. And it's kind of meant here by the smugglers to just kind of throw off anyone investigating the house. So your players will have a chance to find a secret door that's hidden and if they aren't able to, this is where Ned can kind of come in to kind of help nudge the players along. The next room is the cellar, room 21, and unfortunately, here's the death to the facade. It turns out the house isn't haunted, or at least not really, and it's just being used by smugglers, and they're keeping up the facade that it is haunted to keep people away. So most likely, the players will have made noise in the previous room, room 20, and in room 21, a couple of the bandits and scouts will kind of set up a defensive formation and get ready to attack the players as they come into room 21. Most likely your characters will continue to explore this place and will go to room 22. This is Sambalay's private quarters. He's the one kind of running the show here. So when they enter room 22, you'll notice that everything actually is really well kept, uh, very nice, unlike in room 21 where there's a bunch of cots on the ground uh, Sembele actually takes care of his stuff. This is also where they find a couple books. Most of them are pretty useless, but they do find the bullseye lantern that's being used to signal the sea ghost. And then with the lantern, they also find out the instructions on how to use it. The book says that 
that can kind of keep it a little vague, but you can kind of make it a little easier for your players to figure out. The first time I actually was a player to this, and it was very hard. I mean, maybe I'm just dumb, but I didn't really get it at first. So I'd almost just recommend just totally giving it to your players, letting them know the Morse code, the short and long flickers of light, and what they exactly mean. Now, there is a chance that your players keep exploring, and they go into the skeleton room from room 23, and are met with the alchemist himself. He still lives, kind of. This will most likely lead them to the alchemist room, room 24, where they can find out that the alchemist unfortunately was never able to get his philosopher's stone working, but he does have some gold items that he was hawking, pretending that he was able to figure it out. After that, your players will most likely start to head out and explore the natural caverns. The next notable room is room 27, the storage cavern, where Sambale and a few remaining smugglers are there to make their final stand. So it's up to you if you want Sambale to fight to the death. He is not dumb, so I don't think he would. I think he would surrender. But he does have those narcissistic tendencies and does speak of himself in a third person. So it's up to you. So after your characters finally make it to room 30, the sea cave, you'll notice that this is a way that you can get out from underneath the house into the sea. And after exploring this place, they find out that the haunted house is not really that haunted. And it's actually just a ruse to help a smuggling ring keep itself secret. From here, your characters might just decide to try to use the lantern, or they'll hopefully head back to the council. So your characters finally make it back to town, and they give the report to Anders. Anders will probably want to take a couple days and have a town council meeting. And that's when the characters will be invited back. How I recommend doing the next part is have a town council meeting with all the members. And then have the players get invited back with Ned. Ned is really crucial here because he's going to be there to try to plant evidence that Gallon Primewater is the one who is running this slavery ring. The town council offers them a boat and a couple guards to go with them to try to help them apprehend the ship, the Sea Ghost. So your players in the dead of night will head back up to the haunted house and they'll get ready to use their bullseye lantern to signal the Sea Ghost. After the signaling has taken place, the Sea Ghost will drop its anchor, allowing a chance for the players to approach it. So here's where the adventure transitions from horror movie to an adventure one. After having a couple days to think it over, Anders decides that he wants to call a town council meeting and invites the players to come meet the town council. So I highly recommend playing this part out. This gives a good chance to kind of see the different flavors of each of the different council members and kind of get into who they are and what they kind of want. So the players can actually ask some questions about who they are and, and how they get to their station, etc. After some small banter, it's probably time to get to brass tacks. The town council is willing to pay 400 gold pieces to have the players go and apprehend the sea ghost that is working with the crew that was found at the haunted house. Also, Anders, under the guidance of Skarin, has invited Ned. This is because the Scarlet Brotherhood is hoping to plant evidence on the sea ghost, pointing towards Galen Primewater as the one leading this. Their plan here is to hopefully incriminate him so much that he can't deny it, and they can hopefully kick him from the council. With that, the players are given a little bit of time. They can now get some different materials. They're also given a boat and a couple guards to go with them. I also recommend making sure that Ned tries to kind of force his way in to go because he really does want to plant that evidence. Most likely your players will have one of three different options here. They'll probably either try to commandeer through trickery, commandeer through force, or just scuttle the boat, either using fire or just making holes in it. The last one, just scuttling the ship, is probably not the one that most people are going to take, because they probably want the boat. Or at least they might think they want the boat. But there are rules for it, so if they do, they can try to set fire on it. They'll just need some dry materials and to actually still get on the ship and find a dry area where you can start a fire. And uh, the book says it takes around 20 minutes to get that fire. And the other one is where they can just bring axes and just make holes in the ship that takes an hour to sink the ship if the holes aren't repaired, which the crew will try. The other unlikely scenario is scenario two, where they try to commandeer it through force. They can just take a boat, just get as close as they can, and start trying to climb on board. If they don't have any climbing materials, it says that they need a 
DC 14 athletics to climb the ship. And if they fail, they fall off into the water, so that will be fun. The most likely scenario is they will try to commandeer the ship through trickery. So, especially after using the bullseye lantern to get the seagulls to drop anchor way out in the ocean. Once they've dropped anchor, then the players will be able to just row their boat close by and start to climb up into it. It does take a DC 14 deception to get that close, and unfortunately it does fail even once, even if they make it, once they get three people on top of the ship. Similar to the house, there are a bunch of different locations, but I'll kind of only hit the ones that kind of need to be hit. When they first get onto the main deck, room one, they will meet the first mate, Bloody Jorn. Also, once their deception is figured out, up on the poop deck, uh, room three, there's Punketa, the deck wizard, and Sigurd, the captain, also known as Snake Eyes. So those two will probably jump in once the fight starts on room one. Over in room seven, we have the lizard folk quarters. What the player will figure out is that the lizard folk are actually working with these smugglers to smuggle in weapons because they need it for an impending threat. The lizard folk won't outrightly attack unless they feel that their mission given to them by their queen is threatened. And their mission is to make sure that the smuggled weapons get to the lizard folk later. There also is a cute pet a pseudo dragon named Bims. If all the lizard folk here in this room are killed, it decides to attach to one of the players that didn't attack the lizard folk. So that can be a fun little thing. Room nine contains the captain's quarters. He has some love letters from all the ports he's been to, and also has the bill of sale for all the smuggled goods. It is slightly encrypted, but I'm sure with a little bit of deduction, your players will figure it out. Room 11 is the cargo hold. This is where a lot of the smuggled resources are stored, and this is where you'll also find Falfrathoth, the bosun. Room 13 is the first mate's cabin. Here you'll find lots of books on navigation and different routes that the first mate is tracking, and the players will hear a lot of noises and banging coming from the back of the ship. With luck, they'll locate Oceanus, who's been hidden in room 14, the secret prison cell. Oceanus is a sea elf. He is from a village far away, but was sent to scout on this ship and was unfortunately captured. He does have some knowledge and, if befriended, is able to let the players know that these are smugglers and they're smuggling large amounts of weapons. If the players make it through room 12, the Bunsen's cabin, they are also able to locate the secret cache, which is in room 15. This is where the rest of the lizard folk weapons are stored. Most likely your players will be fighting through this entire maze, but the crew is able to come to their senses and will surrender if certain members of the crew are removed. Once the captain, the first mate, the Bunsen, and the ship wizard, Poketa, have been slain, the crew willingly surrenders. The crew will do whatever it takes though not to be captured. They just want their lives and they want to be left alone. So they are willing to take the small boats and just row off into the sunset. So with this new information, the players will want to hold a town council. When they finally get back to Salt Marsh, there's a lot that can happen now. With some luck, hopefully Ned was able to plant some evidence, some false evidence, into the captain's quarters, making it look like Gallon Prime Water was the one leading this whole thing. So this should be brought up in the town council meeting and debated about. If Gellin is removed, this is where Anders would probably want to try to pick one of the players to see if they can become a town council member. And with that, we've gotten the first adventure done. There was a fun haunted house, and you actually got to board a ship and have some ship fights. So all in all, I think this is a pretty good first adventure. It really helps set the stage to how the town council is going to have a lot of inner conflicts and how your players are going to make their claim, their stakes, their... Uh, changes to the outcome of what's going to happen. Well, if you guys like this episode, please give this video a like. And if you want to see more of this content, please subscribe. And in our next one, we're going to be focused on the next adventure, The Danger at Dunwater. Until next time, guys. Bye-bye.